All right, so um, good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us in our Listening SIG forum today. My name is Naheen and I'm the Listening Coordinator. I'll just let the other um, members also introduce themselves. Todd, would you like to? Sure, my name's Todd, uh, and Todd Bukins, and I teach at Roots of Macon in APU, not the big one, the little one. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, hello, um, I'm David. I work in Ritsumeikang in Kyoto, um, as I believe does Marisa, who we just listened to. <laughs> Thank you. And Stuart. Hi, everyone. My name is Stuart. Uh, I work at the University of Aizu, which is in Fukushima. Thank you. Um, yeah, I forgot to say which uni I work at. So I'm at Nagoya University of Commerce and Business. Um, so today's um, forum will be divided up into three sections. So um, David and um, Todd have kindly um, going to present some of their listening ideas to us today. So first of all, David will be introducing the involvement load hypothesis and the effects of task types on vocabulary learning and EFL listening. Um, so that will be about 20 minutes or so, and then there'll be a chance for questions afterwards. Todd will be then presenting designing interactive listening tasks. And again, we'll have um, a chance for some Q&A after that, before the last 20 minutes or so, we'll introduce what the Listening SIG is all about and our hopes and aspirations for this year and next year. So thank you very much everyone for your support so far in our SIG. And and um, I hope that you like what we've been able to put together so far. So first of all, I'd like to hand you over to David. So he'll be talking about the involvement load hypothesis. Thank you, David. Um, floor is yours. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much for gathering. It's nice to see you all. And thanks to Naheen for all your background work on getting this set up. It's, it's good. Um, so uh, the main aim of the... Uh, listening SIG is to try and gather interesting examples of work and practice, good practice in listening instruction, listening research and etc. So uh, today uh, I was hoping that my student, my former student would introduce her research on listening but unfortunately she wasn't able to come so uh, I'm going to attempt to present her work as simply as I can. Um, my former student is Chinese. Her name is Yu and Rao Yu. And she uh, feels that um, listening in China is, and it will be the same everywhere. I believe Marisa gave us very similar information. Students can recognize the form of a lot of words, but they can't hear, they can't perceive or recognize the words. Marisa, what were the percentages there? Oh, uh, microphone, Marisa. Mm. Well, Jim. 56% uh, they can recognize uh, by listening, but 76% you know, they can understand by watching. Yes, yes. And that's, that's a quite remarkable distinction. So uh, thank you, Marisa, so much. Thank you for letting me ask you that question. So my student was interested in ways in which uh, listening can be uh, better applied in the classroom and ways in which uh, students' involvement in learning vocabulary can be strengthened. So um, my student's name is Rao. She's now a company worker in Japan. Uh, and I'm, as I say, I'm going to attempt to introduce her research. Um, so she was interested in various types of tasks and how they can uh, better lead to stronger learning outcomes. So um, first, let me give an overview of her presentation as I understand it. So there's this interesting notion called involvement load, and let's uh, um, keep it short for IL. And so involvement is uh, a three-part construct and it involves the need of students to acquire the words. So keep in mind that we're talking about the um, 
cognitive processes which help govern the acquisition of words. The first one is need, the need of students to know and use and thereby learn the words. Um, the second aspect of the IL is search. That is whether students have to search for the meaning of the word during a task. If this is going on, it leads to a better, a better potential learning outcome. And then the third one is evaluation. And during the task, that refers to the need of students to have to select uh, words that they need or select appropriate words that they need. And that involves this process called evaluation. So um, the involvement load, it was originally set up by Batia Laufer and um, Jan Halstein. Need, search and evaluation. So you was researching this. So uh, just to repeat, uh, need, search, evaluation in task design. And, uh, you know, when the teacher says you should remember these words, that's not going to be very effective. So what are the internal cognitive processes by which students can learn vocabulary? Right. So in their 2001 study, um, then word learning was related to how much involvement uh, was, uh, was involved. And retention or the learning of words was strongest when it came to actually using them in writing something. And it was lowest when it came to uh, just gap fill, which I think is quite a common you know, choice for students to, uh, for teachers to uh, uh, use. So, um, in fact, a lot of the research on the IL involvement load has been related to reading. So you chose this because she feels that more, um, you know, more attention can be paid to listening activities. Hmm. Um, so in her um, research, so need search evaluation, well, she decided to focus mainly on need and evaluation, because when you're doing a listening activity, you can't spend time looking up a dictionary. It will, you will completely lose focus, of course. Then, still doing the overview, um, she had 60 participants in China, and she had five groups of students, so about 12 per group. And she came up with different kinds of tasks, and she was looking at the various um, um, compositions of involvement load in each of these tasks. So, um, yep, so each task had a different level of involvement. And what she did was to um, focus on how words are glossed in the margin. Well, it turns out from work by people like Frank Burst that glossing in margins can be very effective. Hmm. Um, so she had the words in the margin and then she followed up with the students having to do uh, sentence writing. And this was, this turned out to be very effective. Um, so um, the hope was that her research would um, lead to improvements for task design in listening instruction. Okay, so um, as I've already mentioned, um, this is now going into use original presentation. Uh, so the involvement loan hypothesis is used for task design in vocabulary. And as I've already mentioned, need search and evaluation are the um, various factors. But it isn't the case that just because need or search or evaluation are strong, it doesn't mean that therefore it will be best. What it turns out you need is an interesting balance of the three factors. And what she was interested in finding out was what the best balance is. So um, she claimed that in China, there's a lack of focus on listening and a lack of practice. They strongly emphasize um, reading activities. But um, in her previous research, she found work by people like John Field um, that 
highlighting keywords on on a handout that's to say the margin glosses are are effective so uh in china um you know they just have a very visually based approach to vocabulary learning you yeah. And the second point here is that there's a lack of um, auditory input, a lack of awareness of how words are pronounced. Mm. So again, as Marisa was saying in her presentation, there's this disparity between the ability to see words, although that in my research also doesn't gu guarantee that they're readable, um, and listening. So, um listening tasks with higher involvement load lead to better retention yeah and this was her hypothesis uh, and she used a test and a delayed test so um she hypothesized that vocabulary learning would have a positive correlation with task load that's fairly unremarkable and so in her methodology she had 60 chinese students um, five groups, and they had different kinds of tasks, and immediate and post tasks were given. So, um, this kind of research is interesting because you have to um, uh, account for the fact that the words may be known already by learners in advance. So, one approach to this in vocabulary research is to use fake words, and there's a good you know, there's a good methodology for fake word design now, and there's a, what you did was to use the fake word generator, which helps to um, come up with plausible English sounding words, although it's certain the students have never heard them before, so that increases, it is claimed, um, research validity. So 10 fake words. And these are the 10 words, and if you look at them, they, they, they have a strong similarity to words that could exist in English. So, um, yeah, these are the words that she was focusing on in her presentation, in her research. Okay. So, in her task design, uh, she had various um, forms of various balances of uh, the three factors in the involvement load. So the, there was a what she called task zero, and then increasingly there was a stronger degree of involvement based on different um, balances of the three factors. So, um, um, yes, so going from top to bottom on the left-hand side, uh, well, first she started with no glosses, so there was no focus on the target words. And then, uh, with regard to the target words, uh, the glosses were presented as shown here. So the meaning as it is used in the passage, and several meanings from which listeners had to choose one, which were in the gloss, the meaning as it is used in the passage, it was shown in the gloss, and then several meanings that learners should choose uh, the correct one. So uh, the first one was not related to the target words, and then she had this, uh, all these various forms of glosses. Okay, so um, yes, so uh, there was no word list in the first task. So uh, yes. And so, for example, you listen to um, the text, and for example, here comes the um, one of the options with the fake word in it. Hmm. Okay. Then, in this kind of test, uh, in this in this task, then uh, the fake word is um, presented in the list. It means in context aviation. And so in this uh, involvement, uh, there's a single presentation of the correct meaning of the word. Then uh, in the second task, um, there are three options. And so during this one, this, re this relates to evaluation. Um, so the students are listening and they have to, while they're listening, they have to select the one that they think is best. So that involves some degree of cognitive evaluation. 
Then the third one, uh, the word is on the side, like this. Mm -hmm. um, as I remember, that's what she did. And then uh, the students had to make, had to compose words using the target word afterwards. So, uh, yeah. And then, uh, yes. And then they had to do the composition afterwards. So there was this sort of setup of different factors. And what she was interested in finding out was which of the um, four tasks lead, led to the best outcome. Hmm. And so in the, media, in the immediate and the post-test, they simply had to write down the Chinese meaning of these fake words or the English synonyms for them. And uh, in the immediate test, it turned out that group three had the um, strongest outcome. If I go back and show it to you, uh, that was group three. That was the single, that was the word with the single gloss in the margin, plus the uh, need to use the word in a composition. And if we go back to that graph, that had the significantly best outcome. Hmm. So that's to say when during the listening, if they had to, um, the difference between this one and this one was having to evaluate three options and choose the best one. That I, I think pretty self-evidently uses up cognitive resources. And therefore there's quite a sharp, well, there's a decline, there's a significant decline in the ability to learn the words. And in the delay test, this was quite interesting. Um, the fact that they only had to evaluate three words during the listening resulted in a quite strongly significant decline in the delay test, which I found pretty interesting. Um, you know, the choices that teachers may make in task design can have quite strong radical outcomes on learning success at the end. David, could I just stop you for a sec? Yes. Could you go back a slide? Yep. That number seven for group two seems an odd number. Is that supposed to be three? Did you say group? Group two, you've yep. got the number seven there. It, just, it doesn't seem to match with the bar. I'm just... Um, yeah. Oh, it must be. It. Uh, thank you, Rob. I think it must be. I, I inherited this, um, okay. this file from her. I think it must be 2.7. Okay. Well good. spotted, Rob. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, so again, this is the um, the pre and the post test outcomes. Yeah, there you go, Rob. It's yeah, two point seven. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, in the delay test, each group had different degrees of decrease in performance. So this shows that the problem of I can't quite see it. It's hidden by my uh, task, but you can read it by yourself. OK. So, um, so any increase of involvement load from zero leads to better learning. That's fairly clear. And although some groups with higher involvement load scored higher than some with lower, the increase in IL did not always lead to an increase in academic performance, learning performance. So um, you claimed that moderate evaluation showed little effect on vocabulary learning when moderate need was included. Hmm. Um, so the presence or the absence of the moderate evaluation does not have a significant effect on learning performance. Yeah. Hmm. So under the condition of moderate need and strong evaluation, that can greatly increase learners. That should be an R, shouldn't it? Uh, beg your pardon. Uh, should greatly increase learners mastery, not leaners. My students often get that wrong. Learners mastery of target words, yeah. And under the presence of moderate need, the effects of strong evaluation are, yeah, highest. Okay, so um, use uh, claims where the incidental learning of vocabulary through in-class learning activities is necessary and can be efficient. So adding glossaries with multiple meanings of the target words is not advisable, yeah. 
And then when we do listening in students' classes, well, it's pretty clear that, um, yeah, having them use or create sample sentences on what they think is the correct usage helps long-term, significantly helps long-term learning. Yeah. Okay, so that was, um, uh, that was used presentation. I hope that is of interest. Thanks. So, so yeah. we've, we've got a couple of questions in chat. Yep. So, um, and we can also open to everyone who is in the room as well. Um, so Stuart, I don't know if you want to ask your own question. Guy, if you want to ask your own question, or I'm happy to read it out. Yep, so um, so with Stuart McLean's question, he wanted to know, was the gloss read? Uh, read by the students, yes. When it appeared, so yes. So they had a, thank you, Stuart. So they had a, um, a cause, I hope that in English. They had a worksheet and that was, um, yeah, they, they were doing the listening and they, they saw the words in the gloss. Okay, and then we've got another question with how, Specifically, does use research apply to listening? So could you just reiterate the, the listening aspect of Yeah. So there are listening activities. And so the way, to, the way in which to maximize uh, the learning of probably unknown words by students during task by the use of various combinations of glossing and word uh, composition, sentence composition using the keyword. I, I hope that answers your question, um, but it- no, no, actually it doesn't because okay. use research was based on reading. So I don't see the connection to listening. This is, a, I believe well, it's, it's listening SIG, right? Yeah, this is, were you there from the beginning, Guy? I might've missed the first part. Oh, so uh, this is specifically uh, during listening activities. So when you're listening to something, what uh, blend of activities in the classroom uh, during a listening activity can result in uh, uh, improvement in word learning efficiency? You know, you had a slide there that showed uh, an example task <clears throat> from her research and it was uh, entirely written, which, which is the listening component there? Well, the listening, the listening is being played during the activity. So you hear a word and then you see all of those things written and then That's you right. respond based on what's written. That's right. And do you believe that that in any way advances listening ability? Uh, it in, it adv we're talking about uh, the involvement load hypothesis, which relates to vocabulary learning as it's applied to listening instruction. And you feel there's some connection in used research. Is there some validity there? Well, That's you why clearly, you're presenting it naturally. You, you, you clearly don't. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me, may I just butt in? Thank you. Hey, Marissa. Uh, yeah, in my research, as uh, although the Chinese and Japanese are different, but uh, in, in Japan, about 79% of the words can be recognized. Oh, Marisa, you've gone, you've gone, you've frozen. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, no, we can. So, um, yes, per perhaps if you maybe turn off your camera and then we'll be able to hear you because there, there seems to be a connection problem. Would you like to try that? Okay. Thank can you. Can you hear me? We can hear you now, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. My presentation earlier on, I uh, reported on the result of Ikemura. I think we're losing you again, Marissa. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll try and get Marissa back. <laughs> so while we're waiting for Marissa to come back, could I ask a question? Sure, go ahead, Patrick. So, David, do you know a little bit more about the particular listening task? Like what type of listening test or yeah. text it was before the yeah. question? 
questions? That's right. I didn't mention that. Um, so she was um, researching with regard to the Chinese un university entrance listening task. And increasingly, these tasks in China use, uh, use news reports. And so they're quite long, they're quite dense. And students uh, find it very hard to do it because as Melissa was saying, there's this very low threshold of auditory word recognition, right? So what she was doing was replicating that listening task uh, in the classroom, uh, but using these word glosses, which should help to decode the um, words the target words. So she was using fake words to rule out the possibility the students already had some knowledge of the vocabulary. Um, yeah, so she was focusing on these university entrance listening tasks. Uh, obviously, you can't use um, word glosses in an actual university entrance exam. That's not the point. She was uh, focusing on how word glosses can, Im can Im improve word listening during, uh, word learning during uh, listening activities. Yeah. Does that make sense, Patrick? Yeah, so rather than just hearing a word and then writing something, it's more like listening to a kind of extended yeah. report. Yeah. And then kind of a comprehension question based on yeah. that. And so maybe thanks. I didn't, maybe I didn't get that uh, part of the explanation out clearly to Guy. Okay, well, we, we seem to have kind of lost Marissa's connection. So maybe David, if she can. Yes, I'm sorry, I must there. have missed that part, uh, David. So the task cannot be completed without the listening component. Is that correct? Um, not exactly. The, uh, the task involved the words learning activity as during the listening activity. And so the question was, whether that would lead to better learning of unknown words during listening. So, so the task could be completed without the listening. Yes. So it's okay. So that supports what I'm saying. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So David, we'll, we'll kind of leave your questions there for the moment. Um, we're still trying to get back. Marissa, so hopefully we'll, we'll have a question a bit later. Um, so if I could ask everyone to thank David for his presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the good questions. And um, we would like to move on to our second part or our second presentation in our forum today. And um, Todd, I hope your connection is still there and that you're still in this room. Um, but Todd would like to talk to us a bit about designing interactive listening tasks. So um, I would like to hand you over to him. Uh, thanks a lot. So how, how is my sound? Do I have a clear connection? So yeah, I came to my university. I had to fight the security guards to get in here. That's why I was late for Marissa's because the security was like, hey, why are you in your room on a Sunday? Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm at my university and we are going to talk about interactive uh, task designs. And it was really nice hearing David's presentation and especially Marissa's presentation earlier they were talking about dictation and so we'll look at some ways to do dictation interactively and we're going to create listening puzzles um, and basically talk about development so when we talk about li listening often we have research and development and i think in academia we focus a little bit too much on research um, we need research but we also need development so that's my interest is just developing new tasks trying to think of new ways to do things so we're going to look at a huge list of tasks today. So I've only got 25 minutes, but uh, there will be a link at the end to download all the sample activities. And there will be links showing how to, how to do it. I've done training videos for every task on how to make the activities. So this is really just kind of like an introduction. Kick the tires. You can see what the activities are. So let's go ahead and begin. So um, we will start off with... Uh, PowerPoint, of course. So a lot of these activities actually are going to be from PowerPoint. And I will actually share a link. Um, so you can actually download these files if you like. Just give me one second. I'm sorry, I should have had that already open here. Um, you can download the files. And if you have a computer, you can, uh, oh my gosh, it's always every time you do this, it's like always with Zoom, 
the uh, the the thing that you need is like hiding. Yeah. <laughs> like, where is that paper? Um, uh, let me go ahead and just close that. Uh, oh gosh, I can't find it. Uh, anyway, I'll have to come back to here. It is links. Oh, it didn't save. It didn't save. Hang on, just one second. So um, we have PowerPoint activities, and the PowerPoint activities. PowerPoint's really great. Like nobody would have thought that PowerPoint would actually be one of the most optimal tools for creating listening tasks. The main reason is because with PowerPoint, you can um, you can do tasks and include embed the audio inside the task. So basically any type of workbook activity that you do, you can do with PowerPoint, especially you can do it offline. And I'm just trying to find the chat box here. Just one second, I'm gonna have to stop sharing one second. Sorry about the real minor delay. I have no idea why I didn't save the activity. Um, so there's all the downloadable activities right there. And now we are ready to go. Okay, so uh, here we go. So the first part, we'll look at puzzles, creating listening puzzles. And basically these are very simple tasks that are a lot different than your standard multiple choice. Uh, activity and where the students will listen to a small bit of language and then they'll have to do some type of task. And then at the end, we'll show you some more snazzy quizzes that you can do online that if you are going to do multiple choice, you can really spruce it up and make it a lot more engaging than the typical stuff you might see in a textbook or even uh, in Moodle. So uh, first, Presenter, do you want to put it on presenter view? Or I'm sorry, did what? You, did you want to put it on presenter view? Because we can see your slides. <laughs> you can't see the slides? We can see the slides, but we can also see your thumbnails. Oh, yes. No, no, no. I do. Okay. I do. Want this All right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Just checking. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I'm so glad you, you pointed that out. So um, the reason is because I'll show you in a minute when it's in presenter view on a Mac and a PC, if you download it, the audio will play. When I was in college, I so it's actually going to be in presenter view. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, although the audio will play in um, in presenter mode if you do that as well, but in edit mode, the audio will play. So real quick, so why are listening tasks so bad? So they're kind of, I say they're bad and boring is one is because we do the same things. We do the multiple choice, the gap fill or the chart, whereas there's a lot of interactive activities that we can do instead, for example, add to the activity, change something, move it, reorder something, do the dictation, which we'll talk about later, solve a problem, um, uh, color something, sort something. So there's a lot of things that you can do if you choose to do your activities on PowerPoint. Now, PowerPoint is the most optimal slide tool to do this. You can do it on Google Slides. You can do it on LibreOffice or OpenOffice, but it's not quite as good. Um, and at the end, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how to easily adapt any PowerPoint activity to a Google Slide. So PowerPoint is one of the few things that Microsoft does much better than Google, um, as we will see. And the main reason is because you can make lots of little puzzles on PowerPoint. You can make it kind of like a very short activity and it's very visually engaging what the student has to do. Unfortunately for textbooks, a lot of what we do in like a textbook or even an online task, it's really cramped and they're kind of putting in the audio. They're putting in the task in a very small space. Often the audio is on a CD or it's somewhere else. You have to put everything together. Whereas if you do it on PowerPoint, it's all on one page, which is really nice. So this would be an example activity. And actually, this is the one that I solved in my last presentation. But let's say here was the gap here. And let's say I put a gap here for the student. And I put a gap here. So it's just really easy. And then I added the audio to the slide so the student could play it. When I was in college, I was incredibly poor. Right, so here they can fill in the gap. Or in this case, they have to add to it. They have to write incredibly, right? So they could add to the task. That's a very basic task. And to do this, all you have to do is just drag the audio onto the slide. And if the student plays the PowerPoint activity in edit mode, they can both play and write or type or do whatever on the, on the slide. Another thing I like to do is synonym, synonym swap. So let's say you have an activity and you want the students to read and listen to everything. So one thing you can do is say, okay, in there, there are some words that have been exchanged. They're synonyms. So you have to listen and then swap in the words that are different. So that way you can guarantee that the students, again, are actively listening the whole way through 
and that they caught all the words. So then after they do the task, they can ask their friends, hey, how many words did you find? What words were different? So for example, parents, teachers, and anyone who regularly deals with teenagers. So then they would be like, okay, so here it was anyone. Here it was deals. So the student would have to play the activity and solve it. So again, this is kind of more like a puzzle. So these are the really basic, basic ones. Uh, a more you know, kind of fun one would be a word order. Where here, as like Guy was and, and um, David were talking about earlier, can you do the task without listening? Here's a task that you could do without listening, but they're going to listen because that's how they know if they got it right. So if they play this. Craig Rogers was sitting on his surfboard. And this was actually taken from textbook audio. So then the student would have to just put it in order, right? So Craig Rogers was sitting on his surfboard. And what's really nice about this is unlike, let's say, a CD, it's just really easy to play it again. Craig Rogers was sitting on his surfboard. And with PowerPoint, you can actually even just move it around where you think it is. Surfboard. Right. So the student would put it in order. So this is kind of a fun, kind of like easy dictation. Because here's one of the problems with dictation is that the task of writing kind of distracts from the listening. Right. So they have to know how to spell. They have to know how to write. It's a kind of a laborious task. So if you can make the dictation a little bit easier, for example, like a word order, especially for lower level students, then it might be a bit more engaging for them. Um, also with this, with slides, you know, you can just copy and make as many, each slide can be a different activity. So it's easy for the student to navigate from one to the other. Uh, you can make it a little more difficult. So that was an easy one. If you wanna scale it up, here's a more difficult one. He looked down and was terrified to see a great white shark. So then the student would put this in the right order. Another thing you can do would be like a, uh, to do stress is they have to put the stressed words above the line. What do you want to eat for dinner? So here that was naturally spoken. So is what do you want to eat for dinner? So here again, it's more kinetic. There's more physical activity of what the student has to do. It's also very visual. It's easy for the teacher to check. So the students actually just do this in a shared OneDrive folder. So when I open up the PowerPoint, as you can see, I can actually just see in edit mode if they've done it or not. So it's very easy for me to check the answers. It's very easy for me to give feedback for the answers. Now compare this, let's say, to the old traditional paper, you know, activity where you have to circle the dot, put a dot above the stressed syllable or something like that, or a, a, a dot above the stressed word. In terms of time, that's really difficult for the teacher because all the students are spread out around the room. You have to check each paper. You can show it in an overhead projector or something like that, but something with PowerPoint makes it really easy to do. And again, the audio is on the page. Okay, so now we're gonna get to a fun way to do dictation. So if you're gonna do dictation, one thing you can do is have a jumbled conversation. So rather than just have them write random lines, what I do is I'll take some audio. This is from my website, Sound Grammar, which anybody can download for free. And they have to listen to the, what the person said and then dictate it. So here's the, this sentence. Oh, I love that course. I tried it last week. Oh, I love that course. I tried it last week. So then the students would have to try to type in, oh, I love that course. I tried it last week. And for Zoom, if you're doing Zoom lessons, which a lot of us are now, this is a fun activity because you put the students in a breakout room, one student can share their screen, and then they have to work on it together. And actually, again, this computer activity is better than a paper-based activity because it's in Zoom, they're seeing everything on the screen. One person shares their screen. And when, you, when I would pop into a breakout room, the students are really interactive trying to figure it out. And one thing about Japanese students, as we all know, is sometimes they're kind of like, they don't like to show off. But what's really cool is they will do the puzzle and one kid will know it. And one kid will say, oh, he said, oh, I love that course. And you'll hear the other kids compliment them. They'll be like, whoa, Sagehe, like, how did you get that? Whoa, whoa, that's what they said. So they would do the dictation and they would do multiple ones. And then the students would have to put it in order. So usually you would have six or seven slides and you can see the demo in the, in the, folder that I shared. And so then not only do they have to do level one part of the task, which is to do the dictation, then they have to do level two, they have to put it in the right order. 
So again, it's a listening puzzle. They have to put it together. There's like, a, a, it's very visually and conceptually easy to see what they have to do. There's a purposeful ending. And you'll find that activities like this are really good with students because they know what they have to do and they have a little bit more of incentive. It's very visual that they've completed the task. Uh, and then what, actually what I do is, because we do so many PowerPoints, is I actually give them a badge. So every time that they do an activity, if, they're, if they succeed in doing it, then they get a badge and then they're done. But anyway, the full example is in the downloadable link. So you can get this in OneDrive, the full one. Uh, and actually, before we do that, I just want to stop sharing and share my main screen uh, real quick here. So you might be wondering, hey, is it difficult putting the audio on there? No, this is how hard it is. So here's some audio. I did the very difficult technical task of dragging it on the screen. One of our dogs at home. And that's it. So if you have a PowerPoint activity, you can just drag the audio onto the screen. And then for design, you can move it around wherever you want. Okay, so actually I'll just probably stay in the, the main view here. Uh, so another fun thing that you can do is a listening grid puzzle. So if you have a longer text, this is a problem. So let's say you want the students to listen to something that's like nine minutes or something like that. You could do, again, the boring uh, multiple choice, which is not effective, or you can do a listening grid puzzle. So here what the students do is they have all these little bits of language. And so here you're noticing language. We have language rich input which is why I'm a big fan of extensive reading and extensive listening, is where the students can notice bits of language that has nothing to do with ha having the right answer, answering some comprehension question. So I'll get on my 30 second soapbox about why <laughs> comprehension questions are so useless. Any listening or reading text is going to have hundreds if not thousands of data points. And so to choose three or four data points and then have the students identify those data points and then say, okay, you've listened and you've learned is just stupid, really. I mean, I'm, I know I'm, be, I'm being a little um, uncouth now, but um, I'm just, it doesn't work. Something like this is much more effective because here they're noticing the language and you could have little bits of figurative speech or pragmatic uses and the students would listen to the video, watch the video or listen to it. And then they would be like, oh, at three minutes, they said this phrase at three minutes, one second. Oh, they said this acronym at, at one minute, between one minute and 20 seconds and 40 seconds. So it would work something like this. The student would have a grid and all I gotta do is click this and open up the hyperlink. And I'll just take a second and it'll open up. And then boom, they've got the audio. This is a YouTube video. So this is actually text from our, sorry, our default is Explorer and it takes forever to load. Um, this is text, this is a video. Good morning, everyone. Our lecture. Ready to get started? Book, oops, sorry. Okay, good. Our topic today is diet and health. Today we'll discuss. So then the student can go ahead and they would get the timestamp here and they got to match the text with the timestamp. Um, and you can do this with the TED Talks or anything, like really the sky's the limit. And so it's a longer activity. And again, it's very easy for me as a teacher to check and see if they did everything. Now you can do a very, and here by the way would be the answers. Uh, you can do another similar task. This is you create your own. Here what I did is I narrated a story. Again, there's very minimal reading because this is listening, this is not reading. Uh, there's very minimal reading and the students would listen to the little bits of the story and then put it together. Right, so this is a, a mystery story. And so here it goes. It was a dark, windy night. Above, a full moon shined brightly in the sky. A boy named Tom was walking in the park. Right, so then they, I'm not gonna play all the, all the slides, but then they go to slide number two and they tell the story, slide number three. And so they're going and at the end, it's like, okay, what's, what's this? And it's a plastic bag. A plastic bag. So that's like the, the punchline at the end. But a story like this is an example of a task, a listening task where the task can precede the production task and it's ridiculously easy to make. So this is a paper drawing and I just drew a, I storyboarded my little story. 
That's it. And then I recorded audio for each picture. Then I uploaded the picture. I took a picture with my cell phone and I uploaded the audio and the picture. Uh, and then the students could dictate it. It's up to you if you want them to dictate it or not. You could just have them put it in the right order. And then once the students know how the tasks work, then you have the students do the same thing. They take a bunch of pieces of white paper, they draw, they storyboard what they're gonna do, they record it, and then they, they create their own listening puzzle. And you can have them do it in teams to kind of like break it up. Uh, and then the students, they have to mix jumble the slides and then the students have to listen and put it in the right order. So the students can create their own listening puzzle and it's super easy to make. Uh, and again, because of PowerPoint, PowerPoint's just the best. Uh, another type of activity that you can do that's very bottom up is, uh, let's say you wanna work on word forms, right? A lot of us here are big vocabulary fans. Um, so you could have it to where the students will listen and they're gonna hear a, a word used four different ways and what number is the noun, what number is the verb, what number is the adjective, and what number is the adverb? And this is the root word. Number one, my son is very active. Number two, we need to take action. Number three, I am actively looking for a new job. Number four, you better act soon. So let's say if a student does that and like, okay, I think it was one and this was two, but then maybe the student forgot. They're like, wait a minute, what was that again? What was number, what was number three? So they can just click here. I am actively looking for a new job. Ah, so actively, that was number three. And then number four was the verb. So again, this is, I, I, I think this is a heightened design than the normal way that we do it is because again, we've lowered the reading task uh, that's mainly focusing on listening. And again, it's kind of a puzzle. Uh, and once you make something like this, you have the template. This is the great thing about doing stuff with PowerPoint is once you make the template, you can make as many as you want. So then I made one for collect and make one for design, make one for whatever. So you can make as many slides as you want. So you'll see that in the example files, there's a lot more that you can use. Uh, another one, this one's actually not that great. You can do a syllable stress one where the students play the audio and they gotta, not only do they have to get how many syllables, but what's the pattern? So like, here's one. Superb. Right, so the student would have to color it. So they would play the audio and then they would color, they would change the color. Here, it's actually already done. Sorry, that's really bad in my presentation here. But usually they would, they're would they all blue and the student just changes the color of the thing. So I can move it back. It would originally look like this, right? And then the student would be like, oh, that's the answer. And then they could change the color to whatever color they want. So that could be an easy coloring game. And again, you know, you should really look at the, the movement of what the students are doing. So they're gonna be a little bit more aware because there's more physical interaction between vision, reading, and then also like the physical activity of what they have to do. And I think, oh, there's a couple more, sorry, I have so many. Another one you can do, an easier way to do dictation. Okay, so do the word count, don't do the writing. So again, dictation, I love dictation as you saw, but sometimes dictation is very cumbersome, right? Little mendoxai. So it might be easier for the students if they're gonna share it, they just count. So rather than write, just count how many words did you hear? So a student would play the audio, you're gonna regret this. So they're like, you are going to regret this. And I'm like, okay, I think that was six. And so even the physical stuff, if you put them in breakout rooms, they're counting. And they're like, I heard five. And the other one's like, no, 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 I heard six. So they're mechanically having to put it together rather than heads down and writing something like that. So a word, uh, word count puzzle for dictation works really well. All right, so uh, I'm gonna move on in just a second. Uh, I've got just five more minutes and then I'll be done. Um, but are there any questions while we're doing this? No, I, I am, Rob knows this. Rob is watching going, here he goes again. Rob tells me every time, Todd. We did have a couple in, in chat, but we can save them till afterwards. Okay, so Rob always goes, Todd, chat. don't do a million things. Rob <laughs> and I are like always a presentation team. He tells me every time, don't do a million things. Keep going, Todd, keep going, Todd. I wanna see some more of these activities. Okay, great. Thanks, Rob. All right, so then um, now we're gonna move on to stuff that you can do online with free accounts. 
So those are PowerPoint works best if you have a computer and you're doing it on Zoom and the students have a computer and they're going to work uh, on from PowerPoint on their desktop offline. Uh, but if you want to do stuff online, there are three really interactive ways you can do it. The first is the good old Google Forms. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up here. Um, and Google Forms, one thing that you can do with, is you can embed the video. So, oh gosh, I hope this, I might have to, actually, I've already opened it up in, in another window. I can show you there. So you can actually embed the video. So here's a one minute video that I made. Again, it's self-produced and the student would type in their name so you can record their activity. And then here is the video I'm talking about my bad day. And I made this video in my high production studio in my classroom on my whiteboard. So on your whiteboard, you can draw a storyboard and then just take your phone and walk along and film it. And this is the little story that I made in one minute. I had big plans. There were so many things I was going to do. First, I was going to play soccer. I was so excited, but it rained all day long, so I couldn't play. I was so bummed. Then, later in the afternoon, I was going to go see the new a Mission Impossible movie with my friends. We were going to see it at the new theater downtown but it was sold out. It was so crowded we couldn't get in. And then later in the evening, I was going to have dinner with my girlfriend. I was so looking forward to it, but she got sick and she couldn't eat. She couldn't meet me, so uh, it was so bummed. I was so bummed, it was so bad. Yesterday, I was gonna do so many things, but I ended up not doing anything. Oh well, as they say, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. I had big plans. So there is, and they could watch it as many times as they want. And then they would just go through and they would take the quiz and then they would submit their answer. So I'm just gonna click, click, click um, and submit. And then the students can actually see their, res their results. So they'll get the immediate feedback. And so I made this video on my own. Uh, and honestly, it took two minutes to make. I mean, it took longer to draw it than to record it. Took a little while to upload it to YouTube because it was it was you know the way it was. Uh, but again, this is something the students can do. You can do a video like this for any target language, uh, and they're fun and they're easy. So very very simple thing to do. Uh, and actually, if you're going to do that, I'm going to show you another way to do it. I have this already open up in Edpuzzle. Okay, so then part number two on my slides is you can do it in Edpuzzle. So Edpuzzle, you can. Uh, create a free account with Google, I believe. I think Google is the, um, the main one. And here it is. So with Edpuzzle, you can select any YouTube video. So here what I've done is I've imported this video through the Edpuzzle app online in their search win window. I imported my own video, but you can do any YouTube video, any YouTube video. And what it does is it gives you the questions interstitially. So the questions are put within the video. So the student would play, play it. I had big plans. There were so many things I was going to do. First, I was going to play soccer. I was so excited, but it rained all day long. So I couldn't play. I was so bummed. And then it stops. And then you see the quiz here on the side. And actually, you know what, by the way, maybe I didn't share this. Let me share it in the chat window. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, let me just stop, stop sharing real quick. You guys can see this. So here's the link for Edpuzzle. Sorry. And let me give you the link for uh, the Google Doc as well. Sorry about that. I, I Like I said, I somehow lost all my links uh, today. I, I had it all ready to go. Um, anyway, so there they are. Let's go back and share again. Uh, so here is Edpuzzle. So Edpuzzle is great because the student will answer. So, you know, why was he bombed? It rained during the game. He couldn't play soccer. So this is the correct answer. And then they would submit and they're gonna get immediate feedback. And then they're gonna click and they're gonna continue. And if they want, they can rewatch the video or that they got it wrong, they can skip and go to the next one. So then they would continue. Then later in the afternoon, I was gonna go see the new uh, Mission Impossible movie with my friends. We were going to see it at the new theater downtown, but it was sold out. It was so crowded, we couldn't get in. 
So then the second question comes up and then what movie was he going to see? And it's Mission Impossible. And notice there's no visual clues, no visual clue for the actual language that was, meant, that was mentioned. So something like this, it's really easy to make very simple, engaging questions that really test their listening. Um, and also one thing I would like to point out is that um, I made a couple mistakes when I was doing this. And then later in the- so When I was, I think it's this one coming up, I stumbled on my words. That's actually good. Just do it once, you know, the old thing, do it live. Just do it one time. Usually don't worry if you make a mistake because when you're talking live in class, you're making mistakes anyway. When people are talking naturally, they're making mistakes. So actually one of the problems with commercially produced materials is they're too polished. It's okay to stumble. <laughs> it's okay to say the wrong word um, or to, to make a mistake. I mean, if it's completely wrong, you gotta redo it, but you don't have to speak perfectly um, when you do stuff like this. So anyway, that's Edpuzzle. Um, again, I will share a video link at the end showing how you can find out how to make this. I have a tutorial, very easy, and I'm down in just a few minutes and I'm gonna shut up. The best, the, saving the best for last actually, Edpuzzle might be the best for some, but I actually think Genially is even better. So with Genially, what you can do is, uh, and here is Genially, so we're gonna pull this up and you can see this one. So this one is just eye candy, look at that thing. Boom, that thing just pops out right at the student, right? So with Genially, I'm gonna have to just share this link real fast. There it is, that's the last one. Um, with Genially, you can make really slick stuff. Come on, there's no textbook in the world that can make this, not even close. And what you can do with Genially is you can have different things pop up and appear within the screen. So let's say I wanna have a video. So I click this open and now the student could watch the video. This is from my website, Ello, by the way. Millions of blah, blah, blah. So they could watch the video. Then if they want, if you wanna include it, you can include the script. And then also if you wanna include the quiz, then here's the quiz. Now the bad thing about Genially is they have to do it, they can't do it simultaneously. So Edpuzzle and the Google Forms is probably better that way. Although this is the same Google Form, so I could put the video within the Google Form. So you could have your pre-vocabulary task, um, or your instructions, and then you can have the video inside the Google form, inside Genially, if you want to have kind of an all-in-one. Now, this is just scratching the surface. I did not mention Blogger or Padlet or Google Sites or Wix or Weebly, uh, yada, yada, yada. So this is the best time. Uh, we have so many of these cool tools, and that is it. And as you can see, I could talk all day on this stuff, <laughs> so I'm going to shut up. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions, please ask. I think you mean all week, don't you, Todd? <laughs> huh? All week, yeah. All, week, not all day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, Todd. Hey, Todd. Give um, if we could give Todd a round of applause before we get into questions. Thank you. Uh, and just actually, real quick, I'll show you how to do an easy Google search. <laughs> You're tutorial. still going. Um, so, so if you have any questions as well, please feel free. Is it, is it okay to multitask, Todd? Can we ask questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. 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 I'm asking people are like, I just want to show real quick how to find the videos. So if you just type in "lo," that's my my website. But if you type in "teachable," because all my free videos are on Teachable, "lo teachable." And then if you get the home page, LO Class Teachable, I'll put that up here. We, we can put up a list of the links once you get them done on our session page, Tom. Yeah, there you go. And then there's all, yeah. okay. there's all the free courses there. And I'll put that, and then I'm done. I'm done. Okay. And then, and then we can have all the links available. Just Todd, can you just put the link in the chat, please? Yeah, there you go. So there's a bunch of courses on there, but the EdTech ones, they, they show how to do all of them. So there's two. There's how to teach online, and there's one... A to Z of free, I can't remember. They're kind of spread out over two courses, unfortunately, but they're, they're there. And that's it, I will shut up now because I have to give Naheem time, I'm sorry. Uh, Todd, still it's- five minutes. We still have five minutes for your oh, I do? Todd, I have a quick question. And it's Guy from Lexica, Mord Engine. I'm, hey man, how you doing? Good, how are you? I, um, is it possible to call that transcription or is that break the, break the uh, because I mean, dic it's not dic dictation, it's, it's, list it's, it's taking what someone said and putting it into words. Uh, I mean, yeah, technically. I mean, it's like, you know, like it's, it's the terminology problem, like with grammar points, you know, like, is it a noun clause or a, an adjective? Well, you know me, I'm the vocabulary guy and words have meaning. And I, I get, uh, it always, it's like, 
a scratch in a record when I hear people use words wrong. I'm sure if Japanese students use words with the you know improperly, you would we might want to correct them. So. All right. So anyway, what you're saying you can do whatever you want, man. I'm just telling you, it's not it's not dictation. Dictation is when you read into something and it turns it into text. Oh, right, right, right. I got you. But if you're listening to somebody and then rearranging right. the words, it's transcription. Transcription. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, but well, I, I, I would love to hear about dictation. That'd be a great. Uh, I'm I'm all in favor of that stuff. Yeah, I think though. I think the words morph though. I think it's just like universally, like when you say dictation. Pass. Words don't morph. Right. They, that's 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 how. That's the that's anarchy and 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 de devolution when more start morphing. Oh, I don't know. Well, that, that is another uh, that's another presentation that we we should have an open debate on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, but um, you know, since you've given this a lot more thought, I'm 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 so happy to see the listening sig start up. I mean, I was I was recommending it uh, years ago. Oh, great! Oh, thank and, you. Yeah, and I want to be in. Uh, I mean, I'm. You know, Rob knows I'm totally into listening stuff. I think it's more important than reading, frankly. Um, yeah, I want to ask what what does what do the members here think is the fundamental objective of listening for L2s? What what is the like on, uh, the foundation objective? I think the best. Uh, 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 Sorry. Can we focus on Todd's presentation, if you don't mind? Oh, no, that's fine. Actually, I'm done. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, actually. If we, but, because we're about to go in, actually. Well, I'm asking to, Todd, uh, Rob. No, actually, got I got all those tasks. Guy, obviously, give us some thought. Okay, wait, wait, real quick. I would, like to, I would like to, actually, based on her presentation earlier, I would like to see Marisa's answer to that question. Yeah, um, if, if, if we could hold the general listening questions, because we, we're just going oh, okay. to. I think our introduction to the SIG will kind of answer Guy's questions, but yeah, Rob's right. Are there any questions just about Todd's presentation, interactive listening activities, or anything that you want to ask Todd directly about his presentation? Let, let's kind of wrap up yours first, Todd. Hey, Todd, thank you. Uh, oh, just a quick one, Todd. Um, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. And the first one that you were describing on the PowerPoint, the kinetic, the word kinetic really caught my attention. And I thought there's a lot of latitude for you know investigation and research i wonder whether anyone had started looking at those issues yet no and i you know, like i said i'm not a researcher but i think that there i honestly just from uh just observing the students you know anecdotal evidence it works like i noticed that oh. they're more engaged because i the thing is i always look for their eye movement and the eye movement is different because you see them kind of like moving the mouse and like trying to figure it out so i think that there is actually something there related to hand movements and eye movements and things moving in front of them. But I, I'm not a researcher. I'll, I'll be in contact, Todd. Thank you. Marisa, I think you have a question. Yeah. Go ahead, Marisa. I have uh, one question and one statement. The first question and the last question to Todd is, uh, do you interact content and function words? Uh, I, yes, I'm huge on that. Yes, I like the difference. Uh, I always tell my students, uh, I say ghost English. My little phrase is I say, English is ghost English. What you hear is not what you see and what you see is not what you hear. And the big one, and I complimented the students the other day because he said, I'm gonna, Rob knows my, my big thing. I had a student who went to uh, New Zealand and he was giving this presentation and he goes, oh, I'm gonna talk about, and I was like, whoa, no student ever says I'm gonna, which is I am going to. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. But yeah, I totally agree. And that's that's not taught at all, Marisa. I totally agree. The difference between content and function. Uh, most students, you know, um, can't believe what I'm saying. They totally believe that they have to listen to every single word to yeah. comprehend what a speaker means. And my uh, last, my first and last statement is the ultimate goal of listening, I believe, is to reach the level of utilization. In other words, we, I mean, ultimate goal of listening is to understand what a speaker means rather than what a speaker said. In my presentation, the last part was cut, but when I was a postgraduate student, I was asked, I was told, I, I, I was told one sentence. When I was entering to the uh, classroom as a last student, I was told my British old instructor, he said, why well, are you born in a barn? <laughs> I said, uh, I was born in Japan. 
And you know, I, I of course I understand what it means. Shut the door, yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> but I mean, I, I mean uh, that kind of sentence is now old, and even in England, you know, many people don't say why well, you're born in a barn, you know, I mean, about, that's very sarcastic and an ironical British saying, which I love it, but... Oh, no. I'm leaving you, Marissa. <laughs> oh, no. uh, when in the dictation, that kind of, you know, uh, sentence which requires background knowledge and an uh, inference, you know, that kind of, you know, dictation is a must. Otherwise, we would end up listing what the speaker said, but rather than what he or she means. So the, uh, the ultimate goal of listening is what that speaker means rather than what it was said, yeah. Well, so this is I, a nice segue, I think, yeah. Marissa, into our presentation um, about what the listening thing is going to do, because yeah, I mean, um, I think this answers some of the, the general questions which appeared in the chat during Todd and David's presentation as well. So, so first of all, thank you for your presentations, um, Todd and David. So we're just going to spend the last um, 15 minutes or so just looking at an introduction to the listening SIG and what it is that we hope to um, bring to the to the Jout family. Um, I am aware that lunchtime is coming up as well, so sorry, we have to kind of push on, but the room will be available and open a little bit afterwards as well, seeming as we do have a lunch break. Um, if I could just share my screen, so you can just have a look at our introduction of our, our SIG group here. So my name is Naheen and I am the listening SIG coordinator. Um, I also have the other officers here who will um, introduce themselves as they get to their slide. We, we it will introduce ourselves at the beginning of the session. But today I'm hoping that um, I can just give you a brief overview of what the Jout Listening SIG is about um, and what we hope to contribute in terms of communication for our members, what events we can also provide for members and non-members, what we plan to do with the finance and also what we can um, offer in terms of um, of everything listening really. We have become a forming SIG, so our goals and aims have changed a little. So I'd like to just introduce COVID pending, what we plan to do for 2021 and 2022. And hopefully if we can kind of go through this, there'll be time for questions and to pick up some of those chat questions at the end as well. So first of all, what is the listening SIG? Um, so as I introduced myself before, I'll introduce myself again. My name is Naheen. And with the Jout listening SIG, um, we, we thought about what we wanted. And we wanted a forum which was going to help discuss not only listening research, but also how we could use listening in both teaching and learning. Um, the listening SIG, I guess, is the name is a, a, is a little bit of, of maybe not as focused as it could be. I mean, we've got listening, but I, I don't want you to think that it's pigeonholed to just listening. I mean, we were talking a bit there about pronunciation and how that is um, affected and vocabulary and also um, topic knowledge and previous knowledge. Listening is a huge field. Um, so having investigated it myself for over 10, 15 years now, um, it is a minefield. So basically looking pragmatically at how we use listening, looking at pronunciation, looking at vocabulary, we have to look at listening and how it is used with all of the other skills as well. So although we are the listening SIG, it is going to be very, very important that we integrate and dip into other skills as well. And that's a very, very important fundamental um, springboard that we need to come from. I also um, think that the listening SIG offers teachers and researchers a chance to connect so we can collaborate, we can share, we can practice together. So whatever your, your field is, whether your, your general and main interest is in listening or whether it's a secondary interest, we can kind of bring that together in this platform. We'd also like to share how we teach listening and help assess learners and sharing these ideas can help our learners to improve, not only to connect those very difficult theoretical practices to make them into quite practical classroom practices. Certainly when you are sifting through all of the listening theory, um, it's not very accessible in the class. So being able to kind of put that into a task, put that into an activity as Todd kindly showed and shared with us um, is, is a very, very important foundation for this group as well. 
We'd also like to think about the driving force for both current and future research. So this is a growing field. Um, so there are a lot of researchers who are doing work not only in listening strategies and listening techniques, but also looking at theories and how that's brought together with everything else. Um, we also are looking more into digital resources, especially nowadays when we're looking more into online platforms. We also have a very, very broad um, selection of different online activities which we can use and also resources with websites and the internet. So this will be great if we could use all of that together to support listening. Okay, I'll hand you over to Stuart. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Stuart. I am the uh, Listening SIG uh, Publications Chair. Um, actually, my, my expertise is actually in vocabulary, but while I was doing my PhD a few years ago, uh, talking to participants through interviews, I realized that vocabulary isn't just words, it's through listening. I mean, listening and vocabulary definitely go together. And therefore I wanted to help Naheem set this SIG up. And I think it's gonna help everyone a lot in, in Japan. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm the publications chair. There's three main ways that we can uh, you can contact us. The first one is the JOUT uh, listening Facebook page. So we're going to be starting to put uh, articles on there. Um, we can have lots of discussions in the chat. So um, Guy, if you like to put anything on there, if you like to contact us, we can put it on there. If you want to just uh, personally email us, you, there's the email address and we'll put it in the chat here. And we've just got a very, very basic uh, website at the moment. Um, we'll be posting information, we'll be posting uh, interesting articles, and we'll try and get that up and running as quickly as we possible. There's going to be two main um, publications throughout the year. The first one is called The Listening Post, a great name, and this is going to be uh, two times a year, and we'll be focused on articles on listening theory, practice, and integrating the other skills. And then we'll try and have a quarterly uh, e-news uh, letter, which will create uh, for online newsletters to publish articles and links to relevant listening, teaching and learning research and call for journal submissions and presented at events. Um, still, as I said, this is still uh, an ongoing thing. We only just started to become a SIG. So we'll be working on that over the next few months and hopefully we can get the website and the Facebook page up and running very quickly and very smoothly. Thank you very much. Thank you, over to David. Thank you. Um, this is David in Kyoto. Um, my background is in uh, vocabulary learning as well. So what has already been said about the uh, interface between vocabulary and listening is certainly true. Um, then um, we're interested in this page in the events that are coming up. And basically we are looking at having three a year. Uh, so that will be the present um, event which is the pan sig and then we are also hoping to have a one day conference um well due to the current situation with the virus we won't be able to hold it in 2021 but we're hoping possibly to have a one day conference in kyoto at our campus next summer 2022 uh, there's a Hopefully there's a, an attraction in doing that because where I work happens to be next to some of these beautiful temples, the Golden Pavilion and the rest of it. Hopefully that will be a draw in attracting people to come and talk about their uh, work, their early stage work is fine. Um, and it'll be a good chance for people to uh, connect in a fairly low intensity friendly environment. Uh, and then um, the usual annual JOUT uh, conference, which is held, of course, in autumn or late autumn. Uh, that will be a good chance for the sharing of short form presentations and for people to get to know each other. Um, and again, I find myself coming back to this idea of fairly low informality. So uh, joining of voices, joining of ideas. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, so moving on to finance, our, our finance officer could not be here today, so I'll just give you a brief overview. And this really syncs in with um, a lot of how the revenue works for, for a lot of the other SIGs. So basically generating a revenue from the membership and also non-member revenue streams such as events, um, so attendance there, and other financial revenue streams, um, which we do need to look into and speak to other SIGs about. We are hoping that this can generate um, the newsletter and the journal and be able to distribute that. Of course, the money will then go back into events such as PANSIG, other conferences and day events, and also we'll be able to um, get some guest speakers. So at the moment, um, and I think that some of the other SIG coordinators um, this evening will be discussing who potentially we could have as guest speakers for um, joint events and also our own SIG. Okay, Todd, it's your turn again. <laughs> uh, all right, hi, yeah, so, um, yeah, so why should you join the listening SIG? Um, so I'm the membership chair, and Melody, I'm glad that you just got in here because you can teach me what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> um, but the main thing that we would like to, we have a lot of ideas, but uh, we, you know, as they were saying earlier, we want to connect, kind of do, kind of be very broad in, in um, our, our enthusiasm for listening. And I think that the listening SIG really blends with everybody, you know, reading, vocabulary, uh, speakers of other languages or teachers of other languages. So we hope to have a wide membership. And if you would like to join, um, uh, I, on the website, here I put it up there, we ha will have a link. I'll put it up today in just a few minutes. Uh, we will have a link uh, for you to sign up. It will collect your email address. And then once we're finally set up and maybe you're going to renew your, your JALT membership, you can select us as your listening SIG. Um, I'm still kind of trying to work that out, like how we go about getting people to choose us. We're kind of waiting for the new um, recruitment cycle or the new subscription cycle for, for JALT before we really kind of promote it. But yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Naheem, back to you. We've, we've talked about all of those, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so basically with this year and next year, we've kind of put our aims and objectives into um, just one slide. So we're hoping to get the newsletter out. Uh, as Todd mentioned, we, we, we do have a newsletter ready to go out. So if you are interested in receiving that, just to see what we are up to, what we are planning, please do go to the website or we will put up the email um, on the next slide as well. So feel free to email us um, and then we can send you the link. So I think Todd, we're going to um, ask people to sign up for the newsletter and then we can send that out when, when it's ready in the next couple of weeks. Yes, um, yes. We also are currently planning our next event, which is going to be the listening forum at the International JALT Conference. At the moment, it's face to face, um, but of course, we, we don't know if that's going to be online or not, as everyone is waiting. So we are um, in the process of arranging what will be in that forum, but we're hoping that it will be um, one or two presenters and also that we'll be able to have more of a listening discussion at that forum. Um, we're hoping that our first issue of the Listening Post will be out in January 2022. This may be subject to delay, so if you are interested in contributing to our journal, please do get in touch. And as David mentioned, um, we're hoping and aiming for our first listening conference to be in Kyoto next June. So once we know whether that will be face-to-face -face or online, then we will start um, confirming some details. We continue to develop our website and we are going to also be launching a podcast um, at the moment working title Hear Us Out. So and then we are looking for people um, to talk about listening, their listening experiences, how they use activities, how they use listening with the other skills in 10 to 15 to 20 minutes podcasts, which we feel not only are we getting our students to listen to things, it will be nice as researchers and teachers to listen to each other to help us teach listening as well. So here are all of our details. And if I could just put up the um, listening SIG email and also our website there. I'll also post them in the chat shortly. Um, so feel free to get in touch. We, we are also looking for people to come members of the team, whether you want to be a member of, at large or whether you would like to, to join us um, in, in any capacity, please do get in touch. We are a new SIG of course, so any help is welcome. And actually, um, real, real quick, uh, Naheem, I did add the sign up form in the, in the chat oh, box. Oh, it's there. 
perfect. Okay, yeah. thank you. And actually, very much. before before we end, I'm sorry, I have to interject here. Uh, we cannot. We owe a huge uh, bit of thanks to Naheem for arranging this. Like this is incredible what she did. Like she did this. First of all, she wasn't in Japan. She was in New Zealand. She wasn't even here yet, and she organized all of this. So she got a hold of us before. I was kind of excited about coming to Japan. <laughs> it's like, who, who does this? So it's just amazing. So big round of applause for Naheem for getting the SIG up. She's thank really you. been a hero <laughs> for doing this. Just amazing. So thank you so much. Thank you. We, we still do have a few um, minutes for questions. So if there are any general um, questions, comments, or if you want to ask the officers anything, please feel free to do so. Uh, Count Lexica in as a regular sponsor. Thank you very oh, much, Guy. That's huge. We have your contact details through Todd, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope I'm like member number one after the <laughs> founding group. I wrote to him while you while you were talking and said, how do I join, Todd? <laughs> and I got the email and I'll, I will write you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Could I ask a question if you don't mind? Mm, please. Could you clarify the difference between the newsletter and the journal? Yeah, so the journal, is, we're hoping um, we're going to have kind of peer-reviewed articles in there, so there'll be research articles, um, whereas the newsletter is going to be very informal, yeah, just events. and. Right, so the newsletter would be like half a page, a single page, little articles. Something yes, like we're, we're thinking it's going to be more kind of links to websites, and um, here's a latest article that you, that you can read on listening and, and, and things like that. So just a very, very kind of informal newsletter in terms of information in the listening world. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Right, so I think um, Todd, you said that all the links are up and ready. <laughs> Marisa, do you have a question? Yes, I would like to be a member uh, uh, of today. I just wonder uh, how much it will be for uh, annual membership. Uh, it doesn't matter what, how much ever, but I just want to know. So, so I think as a JOUT member, if, if I remember rightly, and if anyone here knows better please do let me know from what i can remember if you're a jout member then you can choose one sig for free um so that comes with your annual membership but any additional sig is going to be two thousand yen for the year so so you can join too if i remember right <laughs> you remember right yay <laughs> that's a crime I'm not very good with numbers. <laughs> no, I mean, if you think about it, the value of the SIGs compared to the overall JALP membership, 2,000 yen. And what's the annual membership fee? 13, I believe. That's another number I'm just dragging out of the air. Is it really? <laughs> it's only 13,000 yen? Yep, for the year. That's a deal. I'm, 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 I'm mistaken. Boy, <laughs> why am I paying so much? I'm not, I'm not too sure. I'll, I'll send you my link to Jolt. <laughs> talk to Jolt about that. Are you an associate member? Not anymore. I'm changing. Okay. Uh, I have been for the last 12 years, but maybe. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to officially stop the recording for the session now. So officially, thank you, everyone, for, for joining and um, for being here today. It, it is officially lunchtime, but we can keep the room open for another five to 10 minutes as nobody is in here. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for meeting you all. And we hope to see you as members um, or in, in some capacity at the listening seat. Thank you. Thank you. I think also if you go to the main lobby, there will be a, an extensive uh, a sort of a listening SIG breakout room.